different parts. Remember what we call the different parts? There are three parts. Movements, remember yes. movements, yes. three movements. This will be important for the symphony too. So three fast, movements in a concert. Slow and fast. Fast, slow, fast, right. And who plays uh, in a concerto? Orchestra. Orchestra. Big orchestra or small orchestra? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, true. Okay. But you don't know big orchestras. Um, not as big as modern orchestras. Modern orchestras, maybe when you hear your symphony orchestra, you can, you know, 85, 90, I'm not sure how big it is. Baroque orchestras, very small. And remember how we talked about violins, violas, cellos, and the basso continuo. You remember that term, basso continuo? Oh, I see. That's not so important, but um, see, that's that's this, that's the harpsichord of Okay, so that's the baroque. And what else about a concerto in particular, then? So that's the orchestra, three movements. What makes a concerto? Why do we call it a concerto? Anybody remember that? Anybody else? It was only last week. No, maybe it was two weeks ago. Anybody else remember? Somebody else, somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Do you remember? No. No, no. Okay. Anybody else? So in a concerto, there is a soloist, right? Or soloists. So there's somebody standing out from the orchestra. A soloist or soloists. So we have a soloist playing the keyboard or playing the violin. And then we have the orchestra. That's the idea of the concerto. It's a balance or back and forth or almost a competition between the soloists and the orchestra. Mm -hmm. That's very much a part of the concerto, right? And um, some of you who uh, will be going, well, tonight in the room, there's a concert at which a concerto, a classical concerto is being played. And then next week, is it the Brahms B flat concerto? So, uh, you're gonna, you'll have a chance to hear, is that what we played here? That would be played here. Uh, well, you have a ch chance to hear one of the great concertos of all time. So, concertos didn't end with the Baroque period. The idea stayed around of a soloist and an orchestra. But the orchestra got bigger. So we have, uh, okay, so you'll have a Mozart piano concerto tonight. And, and next week, Brahms. And this is, they're both for piano. And um, the uh, Mozart piano concerto, well, actually, let me, let me just, uh, no, I won't, I won't do that. We'll just keep the idea of the concerto as a soloist and orchestra. When you get to hear the Brahms concerto was, was, was written in about 1880s, you'll hear big piano, and that one has four movements, not three movements, and it takes, I don't know, almost 50 minutes or, to play just that concerto, whereas the, the Bach concerto is much shorter than the Mozart concerto. But they still have the idea of a soloist and an orchestra, right? And the other thing is, uh, in the Baroque period, we had this idea, just to throw out this other term that we used, a ritornello, which was a passage of orchestral music that keeps coming back, and then the solo passage. Okay, so a lot of what we're talking about is opposition. The opposition between the soloist and the orchestra. Now, today, okay, oh, Composition, solo, and orchestra, and the concertos by Mozart and then later Brahms. The same principle, but much bigger. Okay, now today I wanted to talk about the classical period after the Baroque. Well,
something like this. This was the year that Bach died. And it's not like Bach died and the classical period began. It didn't exactly work like that. But it became to be a new kind of musical style in the classical period. So who are some of the composers that we associate with the classical period in music? Mozart. Mozart, whose name we just wrote. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Huh? Handel. Handel? Yes. It's another composer with a name. Haydn. Haydn, yeah. And then next week we'll talk about Beethoven. Beethoven is a composer who bridges the classical period into the Romantic period. And we'll talk about that. But today I wanted to specifically to talk about Mozart and Haydn. And when we think of music from the classical period, what do we think about? We think about music. Okay, let me go back. <coughs> Here's a, a, a little something that might help you. Um, and I will send you these PowerPoint presentations too, but um, in classical style, uh, quite a number of things change. So we have uh, this emphasis on melody very often and on accompaniment. And the melodies tend to be simpler when you hear a beautiful classical melody, like the, the melody of Mozart's G minor symphony. So, um, and the other thing that happens, another thing that happens is, okay, the orchestra. The orchestra is different for the classical period, too. We have, um, notice what's, what's different about the Baroque orchestra versus the classical orchestra. about the orchestra itself um, apart from the soloist. And look how many, well, so first of all, we have clearly violins, one and two, violas, cellos, and the bass, 
the, the double base often. So we have that clear division. And then I think that one of you just pointed out that the woodwind instruments are much richer and clearer and more attentive. Oboes, flutes, oboes, often clarinets, and bassoons. See, sometimes in certain Baroque orchestras, you only had oboe and bassoon. Not, in, not all the time. And then we have um, we have French horns, sometimes trumpets, and we have timpani. So it's a bigger, richer color in the orchestra, right? The classical orchestra. So when you hear the opening of the Mozart Symphony, this is what you hear: the Mozart Symphony in D minor. This is the classical orchestra.
less instruments in Bach. Than less instruments in Bach. Yeah. Bigger orchestra in the classical. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and the woodwinds, you could really hear the woodwinds. The Bach didn't have any woodwinds playing. It had only, in this particular case, it had only strings. And as you said in Mozart, there's an opening section and a different section yes. always. But uh, Bach's concertos uh, always collect for the challenger modes and uh, very kinds of notes. There's much more notes in Bach. There's in more general. notes. There are, there are more notes. And in the Mozart, we have a, the accompaniment is much simpler. <laughs> symphonies as well, and sometimes the symphonies have six or seven movements, many more movements, and they take almost two hours to perform, or uh, close to two hours to perform. So, you could write six or seven movements. Could you change pen? Change pen. pen. We'll go to a color pen. Six or seven movements. Is that any better? Yes. Okay, in Mahler. So four, but um, the main point again is that we have a symphony with four movements. <coughs> and so the Mozart symphony in G minor that I want to talk about now, number 40, that we were just listening to. I want to just take a moment to listen through the first movement. Now this will be demanding for you. Because it was hard enough, probably, to listen to the Richard Nello form. But let's just listen a little bit. The first movement of a symphony is often in, in, in what is called sonata form. That doesn't mean that it's a sonata for a piano. It's the form. It's describing the structure, the way the movement unfolds. And um, 
these terms that you see here, exposition, development, recapitulation, and coda. There are different sections. And maybe we can just listen a little bit together to how that happens. One of the main things I'd like you to be able to hear, this is a key thing, is sections that are more stable and secure and ones that are instable or are constantly in motion. So the first theme is pretty stable. I mean, it's a little agitated. That whole theme that I played you is in one key. That key happens to be G minor. That's the key that Mozart chose. And that's called the tonic key, right? But then there's a section of the movement where it's very unstable and you're not in one key. And it uses this uh, principle called modulation, moving from one key to another. See, and this says unstable. And it looks like, uh, looks like a patient who's sick. <laughs> or it looks like the stock market going up and down all the time. Very unstable. And then after that period of instability, you come back to the first key. So, what I, I just want to play it through briefly, and I'd like you to listen for the stability versus the instability. And for one other thing, too, which is that after that first theme, there's a second theme. That theme that I played you was the first theme. And then there's a second theme that sounds like this. That's what's called the second key, or the second group there. So that's very different from the first one. That was very agitated. This is... So it's more lyrical. It's a different kind of theme. And that's the second theme. So I'll try and point that out as it goes by. This is challenging to listen to. But it's very such beautiful music. And Mozart really... Um, especially when he wrote in the minor key, Mozart. Minor. See, this is minor. I mean, if Mozart had written a symphony like this,
called a cadence theme at the very end. You know what a cadence is? Cadence is something where the music stops, closes down. Cadence literally means to fall in line. So a cadence is when um, you hear this kind of thing over and over again. Sorry. short, only three notes. This is eight or nine or ten notes. So when you listen to the development section, you'll hear Mozart taking this theme. Yeah, sorry, okay, so. 
comes back, Mozart really wants you to hear what's going on. He's not writing, believe it or not, he's not writing for the most sophisticated listeners. He's writing for audiences who can understand this. So he comes back in the section called the recapitulation. He puts the theme back together now. Yeah. He puts the theme back together. <laughs>
sort of, it's a word that means, or related to a word that means the tail, the tail. And a lot of movements after the exposition development and recapitulation have a tail or a coda. So it's a little extra section at the end. And that's what he does here. <laughs> How many people can name the sonata? Uh, sonata for piano, the sonata for violin and piano. Anybody here ever play the sonata? Yes. What did you play? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I get two. One for me. Okay. You've heard about sonata, yeah. Anybody else want a famous sonata for piano, for example? Rondo form, minuet form, sonata form, and the one that I wanted to talk about a little now. 
Oh, by the way, a concerto, I won't talk about this today, but if you were listening to a piano concerto of Mozart, it has a sonata form in a special, special arrangement called a double exposition. But what I want to talk about was theme and variations, uh, which uh, the Haydn movement, the uh, second movement, the slow movement of Haydn Symphony Number no. 95, Haydn Symphony Number no. 95, which is the second movement, or slow movement, it's in a special form called Theme and Variations. This is a, a, this is a fun form to get to know about, too. Theme and Variations form. And what happens is, you have a theme presented, and then you have the melody gets embellished or decorated in some ways over a series of different variations, and then you might have a coda. So that's, uh, and the theme is usually a complete tune of some kind. And the variations change the theme each time it's repeated. So now Haydn, Haydn loved this form. Mozart loved this form too. Beethoven used the form. Brahms. So many people use the form theme and variation because it's a way of getting variety. And something stays the same, and something changes each time. That's the interest. What stays the same is the theme. So in the case of this Haydn movement, we have. Um, a theme and variations, and yeah, okay. Let's just let's, okay. Um, even if you don't read music, here's the way high themes sound. Are we going to run into problems on the piano?
yeah, uh, this helps you a little bit here. What was different in the variation? Did you hear the melody was more ornamental? You got a lot more rhythmic activity there. It fell faster, and you have a whole variety of things. It's not exactly like the theme, but when you listen to it, you hear the theme originally in the cello. So let's just go back here one second. Here we go. So Haydn's variation one. Just let's listen to it one more time. You'll hear this. Thank you. 
something quite simple, and then you make it a little more complicated. And by, what Haydn does here is he surprises you by not repeating certain parts. You don't get an A here. You don't get a B here. You get a transition. So that's what makes these kinds of movements uh, always interesting. And Haydn always had these very effective pauses. Causes, surprises, and what that does is it takes the standard form, and you never quite know what you're going to hear next with Haydn. There's always this element of surprise, the unexpected. It's a form of humor in music. Because you're listening for one thing, and then something else happens. You're listening for... You're listening for an A, and it doesn't happen. You're listening for this, and you get a transition. Or you get a pause, or you get a surprise. So that's what uh, a lot of Haydn's music is about. So again, to, uh, let's just go back quickly, talk about... Um, some of the elements of the classical style that we've heard in Haydn and Mozart. The rhythms are constantly changing. It's not that kind of steady bump, bump, bump that you get in the world. Um, we also heard great use of dynamic gradations. That means loud and soft. Remember how he, Haydn gives you some suddenly loud moments there. Uh, dynamics are loud, often marked in the music as that. Soft, marked in music with that. Very sudden, he does that, okay. And what are some of the other things? Um, yeah, the tunes are very memorable. That tune that Haydn writes. Yeah. It's very, it's not a tune that Bach would have written. Bach wrote great melodies, but they were much more complicated. And then the variation constant variation and this sort of variety of feelings, not the single steady pulse of the world music. Uh, and of course, the a wonderful use, we heard it right there at the end, uh, the use of the French horns. That's the, that's the art of variation. You can keep changing things as you, as you go along. 
Any other questions about the variation? Mm -hmm. the variation of one? Mm -hmm. um, or sonata mm -hmm. one? Mm -hmm. Or the orchestra? Mm -hmm. Nick? Uh, any questions about that? Well, let me suggest that for next time, next week from I'll be in New York, but you'll be here, we'll be looking at Beethoven, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in particular. And what I'd like you to think about for next week as you listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is how is it the same as, or how does it do some of the same things as Haydn and Mozart, and how is it different? Beethoven was a student of Haydn. He actually studied music with Haydn, and he adored the music of Beethoven. Uh, he adored the music of Mozart, but he was doing new things in his symphony. So when you hear a symphony that begins like this, that's already different than that's really trying to do something different. With it. So think about that when you listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, because he's both classical and romantic, both looking back to the past and where I the most and looking forward. That's what makes him such an exciting composer. So we can talk about Beethoven um, the next week. And then you should also think about any of the pieces that we've listened to over these three or four weeks. Just, again, you write up the page of why you like, and be as specific as possible. I like the orchestration. I like the sound of the food. I like the sound of the voices. I like the way the poetry was set to music. Try and, don't just say, I liked it. I mean, that's good. But one of the purposes of a course like this, and I teach this course in Columbia, too, in my own university is to get people to use the vocabulary. Uh, doesn't have to be that technical, but you know, use the terms and the concepts that we develop, and that way you kind of, you know, can be more precise about it. It doesn't mean you like something any more or less. It means you can explain a little more why you like it or why you don't like it. So let's do that for next week, and I'll see you from New York next week. Okay, so I guess we're, you know, okay. <laughs>